afternoon, everyone. Yes. Yes. Everybody here knows me, but just in case, for the sake of the video, my name is Amina Gafar Kukar, and I am the Associate Director of the International Educational Development Program here at Penchik GSC. And it's my pleasure to welcome you all to the second lecture of our IEDP annual lecture series. And I'm especially delighted today to be able to welcome our speaker today, Dr. Priyadarshani Joshi, as she is one of our very own. Uh, she's a graduate of Penn GSE's Ed Policy Program. And I actually first met her in 2010 when I was teaching one of my first courses here at Penn GSE on educational development in South Asia. And she never came back. And I don't know how to read into that. I'm just not going to read anything into that. But it's been a real pleasure to watch Dr. Joshi's trajectory from that point. She's currently a research officer at the Global Education Monitoring Report team housed at UNESCO in Paris, France, where her work has been focusing on articulating the um, role education will play or is playing in the post-2015 sustainable development agenda. And prior to her work at GEM and her doctoral studies, Dr. Joshi has worked for the IMF She's had consultancies at UNICEF and at the World Bank. A native of Nepal, Dr. Joshi's research interests are in education governance and education finance. Her most recent work focuses on the consequences of private sector growth for the public sector, parental choice, and system-wide quality and equity in developing countries. She holds an undergraduate degree in, econom in economics and chemistry, which sounds like a very dangerous combination, <laughs> from Amherst College, and a master's in public administration and economic policy from Princeton University. We're really, really pleased to welcome her back here to Penn GSC. So, welcome back. We're also joined today by two people who don't really need an introduction, but I want to introduce them anyways. Um, we have Dr. Daniel Wagner, who's my co-conspirator here at the IEDP. He's the director of the program and also director of the International Literacy Institute here at Penn. He holds the UNESCO Chair for Learning and Literacy. We also have with us Dr. Amrit Thappa, who is one of our newest faculty members and is an economist by training. He's also research director at the National School Climate Center. And his current research focuses on the economics of education, international education, and school climate. And he's also from Nepal, so Nepal is well represented today. <laughs> Welcome to you all. Dr. Joshi is going to start by uh, giving a presentation on her report. This will be followed by some remarks from Dr. Wagner and Dr. Thapa. And then we'll open up the floor for questions from the audience. So welcome to you all. Thank you. Thank you, Amina. And thank you, Professor Wagner. Thank you, Amrit. Uh, it's been a pleasure you know, coming back. I mean, it's, it's not the best of times, but uh, this has been heartwarming to be back. And uh, I hope you enjoyed this presentation. So, as, uh, as Amina mentioned, what I'm going to present today is Education for People and Planet, Creating Sustainable Futures for All. This is the 2016 Global Education Monitoring Report. Um, and uh, we, this is the, f the beginning of a new agenda in education. And I hope that this inspires you know, interesting conversation around these issues. In uh, 2015, September 2015, uh, the member states of the United Nations got together and adopted uh, the new sustainable development agenda. And the, they adopted 17 goals that are to be met by 2030. What was interesting about this, what was momentous about this discussion, this decision was that it combined the Millennium Development Goal agenda of the last 15 years with the sort of Rio process, the environmental agenda uh, that, had start, that started in 1992. And some would argue that it actually expanded and covers, you know, it ex it's so expansive that it covers the competitiveness agenda of other institutions, the governance agenda of yet others. So all in all, a truly am am ambitious, aspirational agenda. SDG 4 uh, is on education, and it's ensure inclusive and equitable quality education and promote lifelong learning opportunities for all. Quite a mouthful. And it merges and significantly expands on the development agenda, which included um, the goal on education, and the EFA, uh, the CAR um, agenda, which uh, was uh, what uh, people were, which was what the international education community was using to guide its you know, thinking. The Global Education Monitoring Report, which is this presentation and uh, my team, has the mandate to monitor and report on education progress in the next for the next 15 years. Um, and this mandate was decided in May 2015 when the international education community gathered. Uh, 
And the reason we have this mandate is because we have been a key independent monitoring tool to, in monitoring education for all progress uh, since uh, 2002. Um, over the years, as our monitoring data has improved, we've improved you know, our sort of central mandate. But as you can see, there's also been a lot of, um, like every year there's been sort of a thematic uh, focus on issues of quality, issues of governance, issues of equity. If you look at the first report in 2002, it was titled tentatively, Is the World on Track? By the last report is titled Achievements and Challenges. Surprise, surprise, we did not meet the Education for All agenda. And you know you can read these 500-page uh, tomes uh, online. Um, and one of the argu uh, some of the arguments we make uh, are that there was a lack of financing for all of the agenda. Like it, there wasn't an equitable distribution. There are also issues of not really emphasizing marginalization and equity challenges. So. Here we are at the beginning of yet another series. And not surprisingly, I guess, you know, it's ambitious, it's, it's expensive. The report itself um, tries to do two things. One is to sort of understand education in the sustainable development agenda. So a lot of it focuses on how is education linked with the other development goals. And this is not, you know, something that, um, this is not a new endeavor, so to speak, but it is very much, what is new about it is because of the sort of comprehensiveness of the SDG agenda, how are we going to approach it now? And besides that, we also look at the, um, how, how are we going to achieve SDG 4, which includes discussions on financing, on sectoral co cooperation, the kinds of partnership arrangements that we need. The monitoring discussion, which is um, you know, a big part of the report uh, thinking as well, is, is more technical and detailed. It's about the development of indicators um, to monitor the SDG 4 itself, which is like in seven targets and three means of implementation. So you have you know, questions along the lines of what concepts should, be, should we be monitoring? Uh, what indicators are best suited to monitor them. If we're already monitoring, if we're already sort of studying some of these indicators, what does the state say about the state of our world? Um, if the indicators are not yet measured or defined, um, what are the challenges that uh, we, uh, we have, you know, we envision and how should they be developed? Um, one of the exercises we conduct as part of this um, you know, uh, first report was to also project education attainment to 2030, uh, education attainment in, in primary and secondary education. And then using like the, the most sort of substantial evidence to then link that education attainment projection to the, some quantifiable development outcomes on poverty and other aspects. So just to briefly explain, uh, the education goal includes seven targets and three means of implementation. These cover issues such as you know, access to education at every age, uh, the skills and knowledge that one should be able to acquire. Um, and the enabling environment um, and inputs to promote a good learning environment. Um, there's also an explicit target on equity. And to just provide a glimpse of some of the findings, um, against the first target, which is 4.1 of universal uh, primary and secondary completion, uh, there we find that there's still 263 million children, um, adolescents and youth who are out of school, and according to the UNESCO Institute of Statistics. Related to the fifth target, which is on inequalities in education, um, we see the gender parity in education, which is you know, just the number of girls to the number of boys in schooling, is, uh, is worse like as you go up the education system. Um, the wealth, there are enormous wealth gaps that remain um, for every 100 of the richest uh, youth, only 36 are completing, of the poorest are completing primary education. On the seventh, with respect to the seventh target on sustainable development, which is 4.7, um, which is actually a big, a big immersive target on the content of education, um, we find that you know our, our research, our new analysis, uh, sort of really um, I think highlights the challenges of mainstreaming um, and sort of monitoring you know education curricula at a global scale. Um, for instance, of the 78 countries um, whose curricular frameworks we analyzed, we found that less than half of these countries included even the notion of climate change. And uh, finally, to just point out uh, the issue of facilities and, and learning environments, which are so pivotal, um, you know, just one indicator, only three, three in 10 primary schools lack adequate um, sa water supply. So, you know, please read about this in the, the full report in detail. Um, the one thing I want to emphasize here is in these projections that we did, what we found is that the world will not achieve the key global education commitments. And we find that the global average, like, you know, so 97% of, the, of uh, all of the population will only achieve it by 2084. You remember the education deadline was 2030. And so South Asia is not so far behind, but we see that for Sub-Saharan Africa, it is a real, you know, they, they are decades behind. Uh, so, 
universal secondary education will only be achieved after the end of the century. And the question really is, why is this so important to us? We've used this as our central message in when we've talked to you know, national policymakers, when we've talked to donors. It is because, of course, that uh, this is a very dangerous delay because we argue that education is pivotal to the SDGs. So our discussion of the SDGs is, um, uh, if you are aware, there are 16 other sustainable development goals. And uh, they, we have sort of categorized them for the convenience of writing because, you know, of course, it's tricky because they're all sort of linked into chapters on planet prosperity and people, which are considered in the literature as the three pillars of sustainable development. And we have like separate discussions on issues of peace, on issues of sort of urbanization, which is sort of a growing phenomenon that will be like an important thing in the future, and the issue of partnerships. So the first sort of discussion we have, and it's a pivotal discussion to have, is the question of what are the relationships between education and environmental sustainability. And the key uh, sort of message is, you know, living sustainability requi uh, the sustainability requires a huge shift in mindset, and education must be a part of that change. And simply put, you know, humanity has contributed to environmental degradation, to biodiversity laws, to all of many of the challenges that we are currently facing in the world. So humanity has to provide the solutions. And, uh, and, part of, and, we, and we argue that you know, so much of this is tied to education. If you take the very simple example of um, education and fertility, we know that if we educate women, young women, if they have more control over their reproductive rights, they are much more likely to delay pregnancies. Um, so, uh, and, and a lot of this you know, would really benefit, especially in Sub-Saharan Africa at this, at this stage because the demographic transition hasn't happened. So you, would really, you could really sort of lessen the planetary burden in that sense. But if, you know, as a lot of other people argue, we're talking about um, uh, the issue, if the issue is the way we live, the way we consume, the way we produce, then you know, education and the content of education has a lot to do with this as well. We find a lot of evidence that suggests that you know, people who are more educated express environmental concern. Uh, it's always hard to see how that translates to behavior you know, because the evidence needs to keep improving on that front. But you know, there's some promise there as well. Um, and and you know, education also helps. Um, actually, the demographers uh, among us would uh, would might know this better. Also, that uh, education can help uh, people be resilient to climate change. And one of the sort of leading um, reading demographers in the field uh, has basically argued that education is uh, will be much more important to saving the planet than just building seawalls. And so, you know, the that basic idea being that it's not just about infrastructure; it is about you know how whether people are changing um, how they live. Um, one key takeaway um, is, uh, that we want to emphasize is that we have to stop thinking of learning as just happening in school environments because if you think about the next 15 years or the next 20 years, a lot of the actions that have to be taken have to happen from pe by people who have already you know, passed out of the education system. So education has to happen throughout life. It has to happen th at, in workplaces. It can happen through um, you know, mass awareness campaigns of various sorts. And all of these sorts of activities are documented in the report to some degree, but you can imagine that all of these things are educational interventions. And, um, and, and again, because of the struggle that we have that, you know, the environmental challenge cannot just be fixed with modern technology solutions, uh, we also highlight the issue of you know, indigenous knowledge, the need for preservation of indigenous knowledge, and uh, not just to learn, but also to make sure that, you know, uh, that knowledge is preserved for the, those communities as well. Um, and, and that sort of links us to our sort of emphasis on language, which is, which is increasingly a focus for us. For and the discussion of prosperity, a lot of uh, you may know, I mean, a lot of the evidence around education is linked to earnings. You know, the economists among us know that that is one of the strongest links out there, a lot of evidence out there on this issue. Our discussion has has tried to challenge it and, and try to focus on the issue of inclusive education. What does it mean to have inclusive education? What does it mean to have sustainable education? So um, we know that you know, a lot of the discussion focuses on how education has a major role in making production processes more sustainable. If, if we're talking about the greening of today's industries um, or creation of new green industries, we're talking all of these are educational needs. Like we have to improve, um, you know, workplace learning and we have to sort of, you know, uh, make sure that there's enough like talent and enough R&D and all of that. Um, and if you look at the trends in R&D, it's kind of disappointing because um, 
you know, as, as we might be aware, the military spending R&D gets a lot more funding than, you know, energy and environment R&D. And this is the case in the US as well as in Europe. And in Africa, a lot of the agricultural research uh, funding has declined over the decades. So R&D sort of, you know, the, the role of higher education, so to speak, is not as prominent as it, as it should be. And it is well known that, of course, education improves earnings. Uh, but what we try to focus on in this work with new analysis is that education also really impacts um, our ability to find decent work. So, you know, a lot of people are working and working in poverty. So, the, so like the better education you have, the, you know, the, uh, you can sort of step out of poverty. And, you know, some of our projection analysis finds that, especially in low-income countries, improving education can lift millions out of poverty. And the people chapter uh, focuses on this question of, uh, you know, inclusive social development. And by that, all we mean is that all people, all men and women have the right to live healthy and dignified lives. And uh, so a lot of this focus, a lot of the chapter focuses on the idea that the challenges that we face in uh, health, uh, education, water, sanitation, energy, and even like the freedom of from gender bias or other forms of discrimination, are they're sort of all interlinked. And ultimately, what we need is a holistic approach to cha to handle these, you know, human development challenges. And here, you know, some of the most conclusive evidence is on the fact that more educated mothers are more likely to seek um, help during pregnancy and childbirth and keep their children in good health. So our projections show that if women in sub-Saharan Africa of childbearing age achieved universal upper secondary education by 2030, then it would prevent three and a half million deaths in the decade starting by 2050. And, you know, broad, broadly speaking, we think that education efforts have to go hand in hand with other policies to improve gender equality and health outcomes, uh, you know, discrimination in the workforce, um, in society. We need to, you know, improve basic, uh, improve basic access to services, etc. Violence, conflict, and you know, intolerance are making headlines every day, and you know maybe <laughs> uh, it's too close to comfort now. But uh, uh, we we know that you know persistent violence, persistent conflict, persistent discussions of t intolerance um, really undermine personal security and well-being. Uh, we argue that education is a key element in political participation, inclusion, advocacy, democracy. Um, what we already know is that. Um, is that conflict and violence are taking a disturbingly large toll on education systems. In our most recent work with UNHCR, we have uh, found that 50% of refugee children are out of primary school, 75% of refugee adolescents are out of school. Um, education systems are often under attack. You know, girls, uh, girls, uh, uh, like all girls schools are under attack three times as frequently as um, other schools. So, and teachers and you know, schools are often under attack. Schools are used for military purposes, the list goes on. And the argument is that, yes, all of that is, you know, vi all of these issues are affecting education, but also that inclusive education can reduce um, and uh, reduce violence and conflict. It can also be like a good tool for healing. Um, we don't want to be too, I have a, too much of a positivist, you know, sort of uh, discussion on this because it is true that it really depends on what you're teaching and how, you, uh, how you're teaching, whether, you know, you are being inclusive, whether you are trying to heal uh, the divide, whether it be, I know, post-conflict or post-Trump. Uh, post uh, so a lot of it depends on um, what happens in the education, you know, that you're receiving. But, but there's a lot of evidence out there, um, and I urge you to read the chapter on how education can lead to more constructive pol political processes on, you know, voter, out voter education campaigns and how they can, you know, so a lo lots of uh, discussion on how that can improve how we engage with democracy. And the chapter on place is uh, sort of not, is not one of the uh, main SDGs. Um, the reason it is a separate chapter is because we argue that we know that urbanization is one of the defining demographic trends of our future. Currently, this broad education sector is largely missing from the key urban development discussions. I've been having discussions with a lot of people um, you know, in, the, in the last two years on, who work on slums, who work on um, you know, urban development challenges. And the first discussion that I have is usually, uh, when I have a first discussion with them, the first point is usually, well, we're not in the business of education. We're doing housing, or we're doing this, or we're doing that. Whereas, you know, when you start really looking at the evidence, you find that everyone is doing some level of education. Education is very, permeates everything that a lot of people do. Um, and 
so anyway, <laughs> the, we know that cities uh, understand the role of education when it comes to competitiveness. Like, you know, we, there are all kinds of sort of indices by The Economist, by McKinsey, uh, where everyone's aware of the need for human capital, the need for talent to keep their cities sort of afloat and, you know, competitive. But uh, the new, new research on sort of knowledge economies has also found that um, the big cities of Europe, the big cities of uh, the United States have become less equal over time. And it basically means that the, the gains are going to the most skilled and, you know, who can, uh, yeah, so and they are, you know, losers and, and winners in any system like this. What is, what is encouraging, I think, is, you know, when, when you write, uh, when you go looking for evidence on policies and practices is that urban planning, if it's done right, if it, is, if it sort of uh, considers education and inclusion properly, it can lead to transformations of cities. And one of the, uh, the things that we've tried to highlight, and we even went to Medici in Colombia, um, you remember Narcos, and, uh, <laughs> <laughs> or you might be watching it right now. <laughs> but it went from the most sort of violent city in the 90s uh, to one of the most innovative. And uh, the new urban, uh, like it had, I think, the, new, the urban forum in 2014. We, re we uh, did our presentation here uh, this year as well, whether the mayor came and they were all sort of, you know, really energized about what they were doing. Uh, the one thing to highlight about them is, uh, you know, it's this idea that cities are organisms and all of it has to work together. And, and they really try to focus on public education as the way to do it. So it's not just about, you know, continuing down the, even though it's a highly unequal city and it continues to be, but there is a real emphasis on the public nature of issues and, you know, the public nature of education, the need for inclusion. So it can be done. And, um, and there's a lot of, I think, thinking also around the issue of urban planners, like the people who are actually designing our cities. Are they just thinking about infrastructure and architecture, or are they actually thinking about inclusion? Are they thinking about you know, the need for health and energy and transport uh, and education for everyone? And you know, as I mentioned earlier, education is very absent. So when you study this SDGs in detail, you see education as you know, a second order, third order priority after you've, you know, managed to right, solve the housing, housing, housing crisis, the water and sanitation crisis, but it doesn't really work that way. You know, we are so, it's so interlinked as issues that we need to push for this more. We, we were at UN Habitat 3 this year and uh, it was again clear to us that, you know, everyone there was talking about housing and very few people were really focused on the inclusion, the, the sort of integration of issues. So it's, it is going to be a challenge we pick up and really you know, focus on for the next year, year or so. Going uh, as a sort of a side, as sort of a um, key point to highlight, um, if you remember the MDGs, uh, the Millennium Development Goals from 20, 2000 to 2015, there was a lot of emphasis on basic services, poverty, and you know that sort of thing. And one of the there was a lot of progress made on health, on infant mortality, on you know primary education access. Um, but you find a statement like this, which is true. This is the latest data that says that less than 30% have access to sanitation facilities and electricity in low-income countries. And uh, why is this of any interest to an education report or an education audience? It's because you know the evidence is so overwhelming about how it's all linked. Again, you know, going back to the earlier discussion. Um, if you have you know, poor health, water and sanitation facilities, it affects your health, it affects your cognitive development, in utero development, um, it affects you know, how children learn. If you, have, if you lack access to electricity, how are you going to have technology? How are you going to sort of uh, you know, affect, um, like improve indoor air pollution? I mean, the, the sort of the complicated interlinkages just go on and on. And we've also argued about schools as being key uh, to sort of providing a lot of these uh, um, sort of interventions together. And it's, it's something also that's been around for a while, the idea that you can use schools uh, to, serve, to provide these interventions because children can be used as agents of change in their communities. But we find, you know, if, if you really go start looking at this data, it is uh, deplorable, like how, how little access um, and how little like adequate access there is to all of these facilities. And this final point is, um, is on this issue of service delivery again. No? Like, so we're talking about if you are lacking basic access to services, you're, you're probably from rural uh, Asia and Africa or like the, from the urban areas, uh, urban poor regions like slums and shanty towns, of which I think a third of, um, urban, a third of low income um, city populations live in slums. Uh, and it, they, had, they are trying these sorts of things, you know, let's use technology, let's use budgeting practices to sort of improve uh, who's involved in decision making around services. But the problem is, if you do not include the issues of technological literacy, the issue of, you know, whether 
you can actually participate. It doesn't work. It never works because you can have a lead capture. So a lot of these ideas are uh, what I, what the wash, the water sanitation people think of as hardware and software. Um, you know, education is so much of the software, and not everyone who's working on water and sanitation is really thinking about the education component. Uh, one, uh, one recent statistic was that in 2012, or less than one percent was used of uh, all water and sanitation funding was used for capacity building, and. Um, it's just this uh, persistent uh, desire to sort of focus on the building, f focus on the you know, infrastructure, and not on what it takes to sustain, what it takes to keep it going. So uh, this last point was, was more about this idea of integration. And as I mentioned, the SDGs um, sort of portray this as, the heart, at the, as being at the heart of the agenda, that all of these issues have to be um, worked on together. 